What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to another episode of the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, today we're going to be here for a good time, but only for a short time. And we have on a very special guest, and this is Congressman Matt Gates from Florida. Welcome to the show, Matt. It's good to be with you. And we can let the viewers in on the secret that I am so technologically incapable that I require my lovely fiance to like set up her computer so we can have this discussion. And she's a working woman and needs it back for her own Zoom calls. So I'm sure there are many Americans in a relationship where one person is the chief technology officer. And when they need the stuff back, you got to give it back. That's all good, man. Well, we'll do what we can in the time frame that we have. So for people who are not familiar with you, Matt, tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do. I'm a Florida man. Uh, I've lived in the Sunshine State basically my whole life. I represent the panhandle of Florida in Congress, been there for five years, and uh, I think I've uh, distinguished myself with an outspoken style. Uh, when I think there's a fight that needs to be had, I'm not politically re- correct. I don't hold back. I get in the battle. Uh, my other principal observation about Congress is that it is a fundamentally corrupt institution where people do whatever they're told by their donor masters, who are largely the lobbyists in the PACs. And so uh, one way folks know me is I'm the only person in Congress on the Republican side who doesn't take any money from the PACs and from the lobbyists. Uh, That liberates me to be able to uh, fight for the interests of my constituents and go to battle for the great country that I still think has its best days ahead. I hear that, man. And that's honorable and that's awesome. What is it that made you even want to get into the murky world of politics in that case? You know, I remember being uh, 26 years old and I live in this great community where we stand for the flag. We kneel in prayer. We love our country. We've got one of the highest concentrations of active duty military. Uh, And I just saw the group of people running and they were kind of the typical, you know, former mayor, former politician type people. And I thought, well, if someone wants to represent my community, they should have to at least talk about the things that matter to me. And I think that as a society right now, we got a lot of generational challenges that aren't just like the red team versus the blue team. It is a ruling elite class that wants to centralize power in big government, big business and big tech. And they want to turn the rest of us into a bunch of serfs. And I'm not for that. So I ran for the state legislature, uh, served in Tallahassee for six years. And then when my congressman retired, the folks here sent me up to Washington to fight for him. And I I got to be a part of this Trump revolution. And, you know, I know folks have got a lot of different opinions on President Trump. He's a good buddy of mine and I like him. But one thing that you cannot deny is that he created alternate pathways for change in our country. He was disruptive. He would take, you know, meetings and consult for the likes of a Kim Kardashian or people he knew from business or entertainment or even backbenchers like me. He gave access to uh, so that we could elevate the priorities of the people that we serve. And that was an exciting and dynamic time. And look, man, we were an exciting and dynamic country. We made stuff. We brought manufacturing home. We were uh, productive again. We were building those productive sectors of our economy. And now it's like it's almost like we've all gone to sleep with Sleepy Joe. I mean, I love your perspective on it, but it feels to me like America is less ambitious. America is sort of, uh, you know, more reliant on government checks than ever before. Our small businesses are impacted more by these decisions that discourage work. And uh, I'm not here for it. I think that we are devaluing the dollar. We are devaluing the American experience and like, you know, printing money. That does not make you a world power. Like if that were true, Zimbabwe would be like the strongest country in the world. But uh, they aren't and it doesn't. And so uh, I think there's still a lot left to fight for in that regard. Yeah, I mean, well, what I see as an outsider is there does seem to be quite a lot of buyer's remorse, especially at this stage. I think that the previous election was very much a referendum on how people felt about Trump. And I use the word feel very specifically because I think it was a very, very emotional election. People were very emotionally charged. And I think that a lot of people who voted for Biden were really voting more against Trump. I think people were very, very wrapped up in their feelings. I'm sure, of course, there were some millions of individuals. Bro, you're, you're telling me you don't think that Joe Biden was uniquely inspirational to a wide swath of the American electorate? I, you're telling me <laughs> it must have been something else other than uh, the energy and passion from Sleepy Joe? Man, there, there is no, I don't believe that 
anybody is particularly inspired by Joe Biden. I think Barack Obama was an inspirational guy, whether or not somebody agrees with his politics. I think he was inspirational. I think Trump was inspirational and aspirational in many ways. I don't think anyone can honestly make the case that Joe Biden at this stage is an inspirational figure. But I think that so many millions of people, dozens of millions of people, you know, disliked Trump so much. Uh, oftentimes, I think from a very sort of visceral and emotional standpoint that they were willing to vote for anybody else. I mean, I heard people saying that oftentimes just, you know, even in the UK, people were saying like, oh, anybody is better. Anybody's better. And I was like, be careful what you wish for. You know, I don't think it's as simple as anybody being better. And I can understand some people, you know, there's the, there's a lot of very valid criticisms of Trump himself. I mean, you 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 know the, you know the guy personally, but I think from a policy or the way he comes across, I I don't know him personally. The way he comes across, I can understand why some people take issue with various things. But I think personally, to me, again as an outsider, as a president, he was clearly better than what you have now. That's what I well, think. Well, but so 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 divorcing the the individual personalities, but looking at the styles. Mm. Do we believe that American politics going forward is going to be owned by like the technocrat class, like you know the Liz Cheney's, the Nancy Pelosi's, the Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer class, or do we believe that there is a, a dynamism to American politics that makes us the best version of ourselves? And again, I I don't say that with a left or a right tilt. I mean, Bernie Sanders was an inspirational mm. political figure, right? Even though he's a boomer, he was like all the rage <laughs> on college campuses, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but but I, I I am a partisan to the philosophy that great leadership requires people to be encouraged and engaged. And the notion that we all just have to like surrender to a bunch of the so-called experts in Washington to run our lives or even to globalist entities, um, that is not the most productive politics. That is a politics that I think favors people who are connected. And and I'm one of those guys, I'm a connected guy, I'm in Congress, right? But I, I see that that's not what benefits the people and, you know, the my expectation is Trump's running again. I mean, you know, after my conversations with him, after a lot of my colleagues have spoken to him, he wants back in the battle. He's still itching for it. He's just as sharp, just as engaged. And so, you know, there's the hot news right now. The news that's shaking Washington is there's a poll that just came out this morning that showed that one in 10 Democrats that voted for Biden uh, you know, regretted that, that 15 percent of the African-Americans who voted for uh, Biden regretted it. And if the election were held today, it would actually be a landslide the other direction. Now, you know, I don't know if they regret voting for Biden because they wish they had Kamala or they wish they had Bernie or they wish they had yeah, Mayor Pete. Yeah. You know, I don't know that that, that necessarily means we uh, we get them. But do you see I mean, I see a realigning in politics. It used to be like the Republicans were the country club, rich, elite. And then, you know, the working party, the unions, they really went with the Democrats. And it is kind of exciting to be in a time when our in our politics where I think that's changing, where a lot of like the woke elite, the cancel culture, that is not a bunch of like Bible toting conservatives anymore. That's the like, I've been damaged by your words. I feel threatened by your podcast liberals. Um, and that realignment uh, probably helps Republicans in the long term because there are more regular folks then there are, you know, people sitting around the country clubs uh, and, you know, wondering who the next person is that they want to cancel off the Internet. Yeah, no, I think uh, I don't think that alignment is going to come. I think it's happened. I think it happened quite a few years ago and it hasn't really clicked for some people yet or they haven't accepted it. The exact same thing has happened in the UK with the conservative and labor parties. The majority of people now who vote for labor, it tends to be more of the what people would call, you know, yuppies, people who are, you know, highly educated, earn a lot of money, uh, primarily live largely concentrated in London, and, you know, tend to be quite anti-Brexit, etc. It's more of that elite, elitist class, and actually working class voters in the past election or two have swung heavily towards conservatives. There are areas that have been voting Labour for over, I think, over 50 years in the UK. And in the last election, they voted conservative, some for the first time ever. So I think this is happening all over. I think that this notion that the left wing of the political spectrum really represents the working class and, you know, the average everyday American or British person, whatever, that's all gone far out the window. 
Um, and to what extent does immigration drive that? Do you think, Zuby? What to extent do I think immigration drives it? Hmm. I don't because know. I'm starting to see that issue how do you really emerge in American politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, right now there are a lot of folks who, you know, maybe they they don't believe in smaller government. Maybe they think government ought to do more for them. But one thing they sure as hell believe the government ought to do for them is secure that border. And yeah. as a system collapses before the eyes of the country, uh, it is driving more of those very folks we're talking about, that working class, that, you know, maybe that labor voter in the UK, that union voter mm -hmm. in the United States. And immigration has had a major effect on the UK, right? And, and I wonder, like, where in the political matrix you see that in, in terms of importance? Is that a, a top yeah. issue or is that issue sliding? Well, I think an interesting observation is that people often vote for and support policies which are harmful but not to them, right? So if you live in San Francisco or LA or New York City or whatever, it's, it's very easy to say that you want open borders and everyone should just be able to come over and we should be kind and welcoming and whatever because it does not affect you. It's easy to vote for and advocate for defund the police, abolish the police. If you live in a gated community, you have private security, it's not going to affect you. You can moral grandstand and pretend to be the good guy, but the people who are actually going to be impacted by those policies live very far away from you. So you can be there and call them racist and xenophobic and claim they hate immigrants, etc., even if they are immigrants themselves. And that is nonsense. But you're not really seeing the downstream impact impact of that. Or if you are seeing it, you don't really care. So I think that's something I've been seeing a lot of. And I think the same thing happened in the UK, but more specifically with Brexit. So people wanted to frame it as if if people were pro Brexit, it's simply because they hated immigrants or they were xenophobic or whatever. Brexit isn't just about immigration, but on that sense, it's not as simple and cut and dry as that. And I think it's very easy for people to grandstand and stand on their soapbox and call other people all these names when these things just don't just don't affect them. Well, as America goes through our machinations on Afghanistan now, um, you know, there is a play for Europe to be more involved, whether it's in, in Central Asia or elsewhere. And what we're hearing in Washington is that Macron is really making a play to be kind of the pan-European uh, dominant leader in that sphere. And, and again, I, you know, I don't think America is going to be particularly ambitious when it comes to any type of, of global engagement. Um, are, are we right to think about Macron in that way as kind of the, you know, as, as Merkel, um, is, is less of a dominant force in Europe that, that he's going to be speaking uh, for, the, uh, for the EU? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What I can say, though, is I think a lot of Western leaders over this past 18 months is they are very, they're power tripping. <laughs> a lot of them are power tripping. Their egos have been so pumped up and they've gained so many emergency powers that they're just not thinking straight. I see the same. You see the same thing with Trudeau in Canada, um, Ardern in New Zealand, Scott Morrison in Australia, these places that have had the most draconian, most authoritarian responses to this pandemic situation. And they, they don't want to let go. So I think they've tasted power. They've seen what it's like to sort of be a little dictator. And lo and behold, they're not as liberal or as democratic as perhaps people believe that they were. I think that's something that's really interesting is that some of the so-called most liberal countries have actually had the most extreme and authoritarian responses to what's going on, especially at this stage where you can't even argue that the threat is like it was. I mean, in New Zealand, they've just locked down the whole country over a single case. I mean, what's that? Well, I, I think that what you've said is that, you know, deep in the heart of every Woketopian uh, lies a little fascist, a little tyrant, you know, and uh, how did we not see this coming? Because what you said makes so much sense. This vertically, vertically integrated notion of government power, where like whenever any entity gets power, they want to make sure that they hold on to that and they, they strap on and they never relinquish it. Well, when we gave the CDC the ability to control rent policy in this country. Like, did we think that that was going to make them want to be weaker or stronger? No, they'd want to hold that power. When yeah. we gave when we gave mayors 
the ability to say like what businesses were legal or illegal. Can you imagine that giving, you know, the power to government to make your job illegal if you've done nothing wrong and it's, you know, you're a bartender or a server. And so I think that throughout history, we see whenever a government entity gets power, it wants to grow that power. Uh, and we see it everything from the you know local school board all the way up to the chain to some governors and, and hopefully not President Biden. You know, I mean, Biden seems mm -hmm. to really enjoy lockdown life. He can kind of head down to the basement. Nobody really expects him to, to see him much. Trump hated that. Trump. I remember when Trump was president. I mean, he was doing anything he could to be around, you know, people. <laughs> he wanted, he needed that. He recharged, you know, through mm -hmm. interaction with others, right? I mean, that's what extroverts do. And, you know, no matter who the president is, you want him to be charged up, ready to go, uh, mentally acute and aware. And, Gosh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we, we have that uh, at this moment. But, you know, in America today, uh, the battle is not just in Washington. It's in our state legislatures where they're fighting uh, against, you know, va vaccine mandates. It is mm -hmm. uh, in our at our school boards where they're fighting against critical race theory. Uh, and, you know, the labeling of anybody with a uncomfortable political view as an extremist. Uh, and so it's going to be a dynamic political time in America. And uh, I think that when you look at events like brexit it continues to say that like these things that we see this mobilization we see in europe right now against these draconian measures you're probably going to see more of that mobilization in the united states uh and mm. those rallies and those protests getting even bigger what do you think is the biggest threat to the usa at this stage uh, i believe it is the utilization of national security authorities against our own people after 9-11, we gave our government these exquisite powers to be able to look at bank accounts, seize records, uh, put people on no-fly lists. And now we're seeing the uh, elites in the national security state using those tools to try to label Trump supporters or people with America first on their social media as somehow extremists and white supremacists and you know, ethno-nationalists and threat to national security. That That's why you see all of this parlance around January 6th, that it wasn't a criminal trespass. It wasn't defacing and destructing and destroying property. It was an insurrection because that justifies mm -hmm. those extreme measures. And, and I think a close second would be the crisis on our border right now. I, I think borders are so important to define a country. It's where good ideas begin and bad ideas end. And if we treat our border like a joke on purpose, it is hard, to, it is hard then to send uh, a sense of patriotism to the next generation because it shows you don't really love your country. If you allow your country mm -hmm. to be overrun, if you allow your country to be environmentally filthy, you know, then uh, you really don't inspire the next generation to do their job to make sure the country is successful going forward. And um, those are the, tr the threats I think we have to address with vigorous oversight in the Congress. And we're probably going to need to mobilize uh, a different political constituency uh, to go win. And it needs to be a diverse working class constituency that is interested in these great topics we've discussed. 100%. I know you've got a, I know you're running low on time. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think that it seems to me that maybe for the first time in, maybe not the first time, but maybe first time in my lifetime, not in U.S. history, it seems that the core threats to the U.S. are internal rather than external, which is really interesting. I think that the societal fabric and the cultural fabric and people simply being and identifying as Americans rather than along all these other potential lines, I, I really see that fragmenting and it seems like it's really pulling apart. And that is, I'm not an American, but that's something I look at and it seems concerning and it seems to be setting the tone for many other countries as well. Well, I appreciate the ability to have this conversation with you about those things because, look, a great American tapestry, uh, I think, is important to the world. It's important uh, so that our country, my country, can be the country, the shining example you know, to others. And uh, let's hope that uh, we get a little more of that and a little less of the divisiveness that we've seen. Absolutely, Matt. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. It's All been right, great man, to we'll talk do it again. You. We've got more time. We're going to have more fun. Take care. Absolutely, man. Take care. Bye-bye.